Hey, D&D community. I love D&D, and 5th edition is my favorite edition. But that doesn't mean it's perfect, and I think we all agree a few changes would make things a little better. I've been presenting a whole bunch of changes to D&D, to classes, to races, to basic rules, and last week with feats for what I call the Treant Monk variant. All this stuff is available. Uh, I have the document linked in the comment section down below. And what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be setting up my WordPress account uh, so that you can access all of these as PDFs. Because to my understanding, a lot of people have been having trouble uh, seeing the documents properly from these videos. So I'm going to just link PDFs in my WordPress account. Again, there will be a link in the video description. So go ahead, take a look, and then you can just grab those PDFs and you shouldn't have any difficulty seeing them. Now this week, I want to get into spells. Uh, and what I'm going to be doing is week after week here, I'm going to be taking on one level of spells at a time. This week, I'm probably going to do the easiest one, and that is cantrips. Uh, because for the most part, we don't expect cantrips to be overly effective. They're cantrips. That's what they're supposed to be. They're supposed to be weak spells, spells that are occasionally useful. But we do have some spells that are almost never useful. They just don't line up with the other cantrips. Uh, and they tend not to get selected for that reason. Other ones just have little things that don't work well with them. Uh, and so there are a few cantrips I wanted to look at and maybe tweak them a little bit to bring them more in line with other cantrips. So what I've done here is I have tweaked some cantrips uh, that should make them okay choices, but I don't think I've made anything a fantastic choice. I also haven't touched most cantrips. Uh, I'm only going to be looking at nine cantrips here, uh, and these are just from the player's handbook. So if there is a cantrip in another source book that you think needs some work, let me know in the comments down below, but I won't be dealing with it this week. So let's get started. So here is the Treat Monk variant for cantrips. Uh, and the very first cantrip we have, I have actually made no mechanical changes to. All I've done is I've changed the name because it's a pet peeve of mine. Chill Touch is a cantrip that is neither cold nor a touch spell. So the name is completely counterintuitive. So I've changed the name to Spectral Hand in the Treat Monk variant, and that's it. Otherwise, it's Chill Touch. Now let's get into the cantrips I've actually made changes to. The first one I've made a change to is Druid Craft. Now there are three spells that kind of go together, and those would be Prestidigitation, uh, Thaumaturgy, and Druid Craft. They're kind of supposed to be the flexible spells that encompass kind of the flavor of certain kinds of casting. Uh, Prestidigitation, more for arcane casting, Thaumaturgy, more for divine casting, and Druid Craft, more for nature kind of casting. But the things Druid Craft could do didn't, to me, seem quite in line with the things Thaumaturgy could do or the things Prestidigitation could do. I thought they just needed a couple more options, a little bit more way to give it that flavor that it, I think it's supposed to have. So the Druid Craft cantrip, I've kept the casting time at one action, I've kept the range to 30 feet, I've kept the components at verbal and somatic, and I've kept the duration to instantaneous. Uh, as before, whispering to the spirits of nature, you create one of the following effects within range. You can create tiny harmless sensory effect that predicts the weather at your location for the next 24 hours. That might manifest as a golden orb for clear skies, cloud for rain, etc., uh, etc. Et you can instantly make a flower blossom, a seed pod open, or a leaf bud bloom. Now I've changed this one a bit. You create an instantaneous harmless visual effect, such as falling leaves, a puff of smoke, or a tiny animal. The effect must fit in a five foot cube. Uh, so that used to be a sensory effect. I've now made it a visual effect and given it a little more flexibility. You instantly light or snuff out a candle, a torch, or a small campfire. Uh, and then I've added in three more options. You can influence non-magical weather events, such as rain, snow, or wind, to move around you, preventing you from being affected by them for the next 10 minutes. You can create a cacophony of animal sounds, winds rushing through trees, or the sounds of distant inclement weather in a 10-foot cube within range. 
You can create a mild odor of plants within a 10-foot cube within range, with a smell of fresh flowers, rotting vegetation, or otherwise. Uh, so I've just added a few options here. I've kind of boosted up some of the sensory effects we could do with Druidcraft, and I think it kind of brings it more in line with what we would expect from thaumaturgy or prestidigitation. Uh, but uh, nothing here very powerful. But it's not supposed to be powerful. Druidcraft is supposed to be flexible. But there were lots of things nature-related that Druidcraft, I kind of thought, should be able to do that it couldn't do before. That brings us to the Friends Cantrip. Now, the Friends Cantrip, uh, I think we kind of all know the problem with this. First off, when you cast it, the, whoever you cast it on is likely going to know you cast a spell. And people around them are likely going to know you cast a spell. The second thing is... Uh, after the one minute duration is done, uh, they are hostile to you. So you're not really making friends at all. And quite often a conversation might go longer than a minute. So then we lose the friends cantrip and suddenly they're hostile and whatever benefit we might have gained is lost. So how do we make this spell work the way it's intended to? So the first thing I've done is I've changed the components. Uh, it used to be that we had a somatic component and a material component. Now I've changed it to a verbal component. Uh, and our duration has changed as well. Uh, it used to be concentration up to one minute. It is now concentration up to 10 minutes. For the duration, you have advantage on all charisma checks directed at one creature of your choice that isn't hostile to you. When the spell ends, the creature realizes that you use magic to influence its mood and it becomes hostile to you. A creature prone to violence might attack you. Another creature might seek retribution in other ways at the DM's discretion, depending on the nature of your interaction with it. The verbal component of this spell may be slipped into casual conversation. A successful wisdom insight check contested by your charisma deception check, which is made with advantage, allows a listener to determine that a spell has been cast. Uh, so there's two things here. First off, uh, we're making it so that you can cast this spell while you're in a conversation with somebody without it being obvious that you cast a spell. And the second thing is, because of the increased duration, uh, we can often gain the benefits of that improved social interaction and we might be long gone before the spell finally expires and the creature realizes they've been duped. Again, not a super powerful cantrip, but now I think one that will accomplish what it was supposed to do. The next spell I want to talk about is Poison Spray. Now Poison Spray is a spell that I think basically became pointless after Toll the Dead uh, because Toll the Dead is a spell that did a better damage type, it had a better range uh, and it hit a better saving throw and essentially did the same damage. Uh, so what was the point of Poison Spray? And even before Toll the Dead, the problems with range, the problems with the saving throw it hit, and the problems with the damage type it did, just made it not a very good damage cantrip. So what I've done here is, obviously Poison Spray still needs to be Poison Damage. I don't see how we get around that. It's a Poison Spray. Uh, so what I've done is, I've kept the range the same, but you extend your hand towards a creature you can see within range and project a puff of nauseous gas from your palm. The creature must succeed on a constitution saving throw where they take 1d10 poison damage, so I've actually lowered the damage here, and suffer the poison condition, Appendix A, until the beginning of your next turn. Spell's damage increases by d10 when you reach 5th level, 11th level, 17th level. Uh, so the big thing here is I've added the poison condition. Now, we still have all the bad stuff of this spell. It still has the poor range, it still has the poor damage type, and generally speaking, when the creature is immune to poison, they're also immune to the poison condition. But when we can use this spell, we've given it something now that nothing else has, and that's the poison condition. Poison condition is pretty bad. Uh, being able to inflict it for a round with a cantrip isn't a bad option at all, if it's applicable. Uh, now we're hitting a good saving throw, so it's not reliable, but it is a cantrip. And for a cantrip to be able to deliver a condition like the poison condition is pretty good. So I think that helps make up for the fact that we're going up against a difficult saving throw and we're dealing with a low range. In fact, so much so that I actually tempered the damage to a small degree. That brings us to Produce Flame. Produce Flame is a druid cantrip. Uh, what you would do is you would cast it, create a ball of flame in your hand. Uh, then if you wanted to make an attack with it, you threw it. Uh, and that ended the spell. Now there were a few problems with this. It is the only uh, range cantrip that a druid gets in the player's handbook, though the range is actually no more than Thorn Whip, which is a melee cantrip, uh, and one of the purposes of this spell was you could create it to create a light source, but as soon as you make an attack roll, you're throwing away your light source, and suddenly you're in darkness again. 
and considering this spell had such a terrible range, the damage was pretty bad. It did a d8 damage. Uh, so what I've done here is now uh, we're going to keep the casting time, the range, the components, the duration all the same. Flickering flame of light appears in your hand. The flame remains there for the duration and harms neither you nor your equipment. The flame sheds a bright light in 10 foot radius, dim light in an additional 10 feet. The spell ends if you dismiss it as an action or you cast it again. You can also attack with the flame when you cast a spell or as an action on a later turn. You can hurl the flame at a creature within 30 feet of you. Make a ranged spell attack. On a hit, the target takes 1d10 fire damage. So that's the first change I've made is I've boosted the damage. It now does basically the same damage as a firebolt. Less range, but we have the advantage of being able to use it to shed light. When you do so, another flame appears instantaneously in your hand if you wish it to do so, otherwise the spell ends. So we can choose to end the spell at that point, or we can have the spell instantaneously replaced and we don't throw away our light source. And that's all I did. So we're gonna do a little bit more damage and it's not going to end the spell when we use it as an attack. That brings us to resistance, to what I've always considered to be the weak cousin of Guidance. Uh, because with resistance, unlike Guidance, we're boosting saving throws instead of ability checks. And the thing about saving throws is we tend not to know when we're going to make them. Uh, well, with ability checks, we often do know beforehand. So that gives Guidance all kinds of uses and resistance not very many uses. Uh, so we have resistance and we never know when to cast it. And so we don't cast it and then we make a saving throw and too bad we didn't have resistance up. So the only thing I've done here is I've boosted the duration. We've gone from a duration of concentration one minute to concentration 10 minutes. 10 minutes is plenty of time that we might have to make a saving throw. This is something you might want to add as a buff if you're not concentrating on something else then throw resistance on yourself or somebody else, and they're gonna get that 1d4 bonus to their next saving throw. Again, we're not going super powerful here, but this is something that would make resistance a reasonably useful spell to have, especially at low levels. This brings us to a cantrip I've had many conversations with people about, many arguments with people about, and that's shocking grasp. Uh, and the arguments always go like this. They tell me that shocking grasp is actually a good cantrip. And I say, no, it's not. It does average damage for a cantrip. It requires a touch attack to hit. And we could choose a spell that has a great range and does more damage. Uh, and what they will always tell me is, yeah, but Shocking Grasp is a great way to get out of melee. Because if you cast Shocking Grasp when you're in melee, then they will lose their ability to use their reaction, which means we can now disengage from combat without taking an attack of opportunity uh, and we get to do the damage. And I've always said that, yes, you can do that, but you could just take the disengage action. And the disengage action is better because the disengage action always works. Well, Shocking Grasp, you might miss with it. If you miss with Shocking Grasp, that enemy can still make their opportunity attack, so you've lost your ability to get out of combat and only for the chance to do some crappy cantrip damage. So when I looked at Shocking Grasp, I thought, to me, the obvious fix is to have Shocking Grasp work in the way it's been described to me. If it works in the way it's been described to me, I think it could be a reasonable cantrip. We're going to keep it at one action casting time, touch spell, verbal somatic component with an instantaneous duration. Lightning springs from your hand to deliver a shock to a creature you touch. The creature must succeed on a dexterity saving throw or take 1d8 lightning damage and can take reactions until the start of its next turn. So the first change here is normally it required a to hit roll. I've changed it to a saving throw. I'll explain why very soon. If the creature succeeds on the saving throw, it takes no damage, but it cannot take opportunity attacks against you until the end of your next turn. So what we're going to do now is if you cast the Shocking Grasp cantrip, Maybe you'll do damage and prevent reactions. If you fail in that, at least it will get you the ability to disengage from combat without taking the attack of opportunity. That, for the first time, makes Shocking Grasp objectively superior to taking the disengage action. And then we're going to have our standard damage scaling at 5th, 11th, and 17th level. Now, my original thought was to keep it as an attack roll. And what would happen is if you missed, you could still... Uh, move without provoking attacks of opportunity, but that didn't make sense uh, because if you miss the creature, then why is it not able to make uh, opportunity attacks? 
But by having it as a saving throw, what you're doing is you're making it so that you are absolutely hitting the creature. You're touching the creature, electricity is surging through them, and maybe they take some damage and it severely impacts their ability to take a reaction, or a light shock, and it just minorly affects their ability to make a reaction, which just made more sense to me. That brings us to True Strike. This is probably the worst cantrip in D&D, and I think it gets more hate than any other cantrip in D&D, and it deserves so, uh, because it really is bad. Uh, you cast it on yourself, uses your concentration, it's going to give you advantage on your next attack, but it takes an action to cast it in the first place. So how often is having advantage on one attack better than just attacking twice? Almost never. And we're using a spell to do it, we have to select a cantrip to do it, we have to use a concentration to do it. It's just terrible. So what I've done with True Strike is the first thing is, instead of being a self spell, I've made it a 30 foot range spell. So we can cast True Strike on somebody else. It's a somatic component, concentration one round. You point your finger at a willing target in range. That could be yourself or somebody else. Your magic helps guide their attacks. At any time until the beginning of your next turn, when the target makes an attack roll, you may immediately use your reaction to have them re-roll the attack. You can choose to do so after they roll the attack, but before the outcome is determined. Doing so ends the spell. Now the question is, is this just worse than the help action? And I'd say, no, this isn't worse than the help action. In fact, it was mentioned to me that the mastermind, a rogue, can make a help action as a bonus action. And doesn't this just kind of step on those toes? No, I, I think they work well together in concert. True strike doesn't have to be used on the next attack. And it is a reroll, not advantage. So all these things can be combined together. If you use your bonus action to, say, give somebody the help action, uh, and then you use true strike, on them as well, uh, then when they make their attack roll, they would do so with advantage because of the help action. If they hit, great. Uh, then when they make their next attack, they would do so without advantage. And if they miss, you could then use your true strike to give them a re-roll. But let's say they miss that first attack, um, despite the advantage. If you use your true strike, they could attack again and again with advantage. Now, again, I haven't made true strike a great spell. Uh, but I think as a cantrip, it, there are now specific uses for it. Uh, you would still need to think when you took True Strike how you're going to use it effectively, but there are at least now scenarios where you can use True Strike effectively, and that's all there needed to be. And that takes us to the final cantrip I'm going to talk about today, and that's Vicious Mockery. Now, Vicious Mockery, I think, is actually a decent spell at first level. Uh, you cast it. It targets a decent saving throw. Uh, if they fail their saving throw, they take a d4 damage, which is nothing, uh, but they get disadvantage on their next attack roll, which is something. But what happens is, is the scaling on this is so bad, because at 5th level it becomes 2d4 damage, at 11th level 3d4 damage, and at 17th level 4d4 damage. So casting this spell at 17th level actually isn't very much better than casting it at 1st level, even though it's supposed to be a scaling cantrip. And the secondary effect actually gets worse as you go up in levels, because at first level, most creatures are going to be attacking once. But at high levels, most of them can attack multiple times. Some of them can attack several times. So when it came to how Vicious Mockery should scale, that was fairly clear to me. Uh, so this remains a one-action casting, 60-foot range, verbal component, instantaneous duration. You unleash a string of insults laced with subtle enchantments at a creature you can see within range. If the target can hear you, though it need not understand you, it must succeed on a wisdom saving throw or take 1d4 psychic damage and have disadvantage on the next attack roll it can make before the end of its next turn. So the base spell unchanged. Here's where it changes. The spell causes disadvantage on the next two attacks when you reach 5th level, the next three attacks at 11th level, and the next four attacks at 17th level. Now this is still limited to... Uh, attacks it makes before the end of its next turn, but as we go up in levels, it's not uncommon for creatures to be making two, three, or four attacks. We're going to give them disadvantage on those attacks. So the damage here isn't going to scale at all. All that's going to happen is it's going to affect more attacks, and that is a better scaling for Vicious Mockery than scaling the d4 damage, because what people who play bards who take Vicious Mockery know is Vicious Mockery isn't about the d4 psychic damage. 
that's a kind of a nice to have, but it's really the secondary effect. The primary effect of vicious mockery is the disadvantage on the next attack roll. And if we make that scale, it's far more appropriate than having the D4 scale. So that is all the changes I made to the player's handbook cantrips. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. I know this was far, far less comprehensive than we saw with feats last week. And frankly, glad for the break. Uh, but what I'll be doing in the weeks to follow is we'll be going in over first, second, third, all the way up to ninth level spells. Uh, and then the player's handbook variant will be complete. After that, I will be looking at other source books. But for the next several weeks, we're going to be focusing on spells. So until then, I'm going to sit back, relax, have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everyone. See you next week.